All right, Amelia, you want to kick us off? Absolutely. Well, welcome and thank you all for your patience as we have worked through our fun little technical difficulties. Um, the rest of the hour should be smooth sailing and uh, we've got we've got some great uh, information to share with you all today. Welcome to the Alzheimer's and Dementia Research in the LGBT Community webinar. I'm Amelia Schaefer. I'm our Senior Director of Growth and Engagement Strategy for DEI at the Alzheimer's Association, and I will be your moderator for today. So before we begin, we thought we'd uh, start with something a little bit fun, which is a poll, because we'd love to hear why all of you are here today. So Stephanie's going to launch a poll for us to um, just help us get to know you all a little more and learn why you are here today. So just click the answer or all the answers that apply to you once Stephanie uh, launches that poll. Also technical difficulties on this, continue. <laughs> It'll put launch in just a moment. It's going to launch in just a moment, but I do love seeing the chat um, from folks joining us from all across right now, what I think is just the United States, but we may have some folks joining us from outside the United States. So if you if you get a moment, uh, the chat on the bottom of your screen there, type in where you're from, where are you joining from today? We'd love to uh, we'd love to see kind of what representation we have from across the country and maybe even beyond. Got some Texas, New York. Hello, I saw. Helena, fantastic, Indiana, some folks from California, Pennsylvania, Denver, Colorado, Florida, fantastic. Look at that. Got some great, great folks here today. Um, well, Stephanie, while we're waiting on uh, that poll to launch, I just wanted to share with some of you, some of you know the Alzheimer's Association well, and some of you don't, but Research is such a okay. Research is such an important part of the Alzheimer's Association. We're actually the world's largest nonprofit funder of Alzheimer's research, and currently are investing over 250 million in more than 730 projects in 39 countries. So to come to you today and be able to present this uh, research uh, webinar is, is right in our wheelhouse. Fantastic, I don't know about you all, but I just saw a poll show up on my screen. Uh, please mark your relationship to the LGBTQ community again. If you fit in multiple categories, um, go ahead and mark several of those. And I'll give you a moment to read that and then be sure you hit that submit button on the bottom. So while we're waiting for you all to hit submit on that, um, as I was saying, we're very excited um, to present a research webinar because that's right in our wheelhouse at the Alzheimer's Association. Stephanie, how does it look? Do we have enough folks who have answered that poll to show us some results? We sure do. Wonderful. Oh, great. Well, look at that. We've got a lot of folks here. We've got a lot of professionals working in the community, a lot of people who care for someone uh, who is uh, identifies as a member of the LGBTQ community, and a lot of people here who are members of the LGBTQ community, um, and many people who, who just care as well. So welcome to all of you, um, and thanks for joining us. We're, we're happy to have you all here. This is uh, an exciting um, time because you're going to hear from two of the experts in the field of health equity, really talking about the impact of Alzheimer's and dementia on the LGBTQ community, and especially what's happening in the research world. Um, now, throughout the conversation, you are welcome to submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom. Um, you should see a Q&A but button, and we will save some time at the end to get to some of those questions. Um, so please just go ahead and submit those throughout, and we will hold those until the end. We're co-hosting this webinar today with our partner and friends, uh, SAGE, which um, is a, a fantastic organization, one of our longest time partnerships. SAGE, for those of you who aren't aware, um, stands for Advocacy and Services for LGBT Elders. They are really have been focused for many, many years um, around not just 
uh, services and advocacy, but also connecting the LGBTQ community, specifically in the, in the world of aging. So here to introduce our speakers today is my friend from SAGE, Reynaldo Morales, who is the Director of Coalition Building for SAGE. Reynaldo, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Amelia, and thank you, everyone. Bienvenidos a todos. Buenos dias, if you're actually on the West Coast, like I am in Denver, Colorado. So just want to welcome all you all to this wonderful presentation that we have for you this webinar. At SAGE, we appreciate our longstanding partnership, just like Amelia said, with the Alzheimer's Association to help bring more visibility and resources to the LGBT community who are living with Alzheimer's and dementia. I'm happy to introduce our two guest speakers for today, Dr. Jason Flatt and Dr. Carl Hill. Dr. Jason D. Flatt is an assistant professor in the social and behavioral health program at the UNLV School of Public Health. Jason's current research works to better understand the risk and protective factors for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias among LGBTQ seniors. He also is exploring the role of affordable and inclusive housing for LGBTQ seniors, building healthy outcomes using a supportive environment or building house, the initials. His research interests focus on improving health among vulnerable aging populations, including sexual and gender minorities, racial ethnic minorities, and other disadvantaged groups to have more time to actually participate in daily life, have sustained independence, and hold on to memories longer. Dr. Carl Hill is the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for the Alzheimer's Association, overseeing strategic initiatives to strengthen the association's outreach to all populations, and providing communities with resources and support to address the Alzheimer's crisis. Dr. Hill, previously served as the association's vice president, president of scientific engagement. Prior to joining the association, he served as director for the Office of Special Populations at the National Institutes on Aging. Throughout Dr. Hill's six years in this role, he led the development of the NIA Health Disparities Research Framework, which stimulates studies focused on health disparities related to aging. He also directed the NIA Butler Williams Scholars Program, which provides yearly training for early career investigators interested in aging research. Bienvenidos, welcome Dr. Flat and Dr. Hill. Thank you. All right, well, I think I'll get started and then um, I'll pass the, the mic to Dr. Hill, who will uh, talk more about health equity at the Alzheimer's Association. So I wanted to get started and get us all on the same page in terms of terminology. So today you're gonna to hear some different terms that fall under a broader umbrella of thinking about dementia. So you're gonna hear about cognition, which tends to represent people's thinking, memory, or other related skills, things like language, perception, vision, visuospatial skills. You're also going to hear the term dementia quite a bit. And dementia is an umbrella term. And often when we think about that, it can represent different types of dementias, right? So the most common one that we hear about is Alzheimer's disease. Right, and so this is commonly demonstrated by people who have deficits in their memory and thinking. But there are also other types of dementia. For instance, there's vascular dementia, there's Lewy body dementia, and there's frontal temporal dementia. So you'll also hear today some terms where I use a broader inclusive of types of dementia that are related to having memory and thinking deficits. So I'll be using the term Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, or ADRD. You're also going to hear about mild cognitive impairment. So when we think about mild cognitive impairment, this typically represents some slight but noticeable changes in people's cognition, right? And we usually see that it's declining or getting worse, but it doesn't meet sort of the um, qualifications for broader dementia. 
So, but it can progress or it can get better. We also will use the term subjective cognitive decline. And this is typically where people just self-report that they're having problems with their memory and thinking, and perhaps it's been getting worse over the past 12 months. This doesn't represent necessarily any cognitive impairment, but research has shown that people that report greater problems with their memory and thinking over time do have a risk for dementia later on in life. So you'll hear about these different terms that I'll be using. I'll try to define it first for you, but I just wanted to get us all on the same page in terms of what we'll be talking about today. I'll also be highlighting some different terms, and you heard this when Ronaldo mentioned my bio, but you're gonna hear terms like sexual and gender minority, or, and you'll also be hearing things like LGBTQIA. So sexual minority, this is an umbrella term that represents individuals who would self-identify as something other than heterosexual. So this could include, include people who are asexual, bisexual, gay, lesbian, queer, as well as those that might not even use those terms, but they don't identify as heterosexual. You'll also be hearing terms that represent gender minorities or people who self-identify as transgender, non-binary, or use terms that um, demonstrate that they don't represent as cisgender. So their gender identity or expression doesn't conform to broader societal and cultural expectations that are often based on the sex assigned to them at birth. You'll also hear the term cisgender, which represents people who do not identify as transgender, right? They identify their gender identity aligns with the sex they were assigned to them at birth. It's important also that we realize that sexual orientation and gender identity can evolve over the lifespan. So it's important that we recognize that terms will change, but also people's identities may shift. I wanted to emphasize a little bit more about gender. And so I really love this figure from the trans student educational resources, the gender unicorn. And what this shows you is that both um, sexual orientation and gender identity happen on a uh, continuum, right? And so it is not a binary, you're gay, you're straight, you're gay, you're heterosexual people can fall under a spectrum in terms of their identity or a continuum. So you can see here also some terms on the right that I use to highlight a range of terms that can be used to describe gender identity, right? And so gender identity can be one sense of being a man, a woman, both transgender or another identity, right? And often when we think about people whose gender identity doesn't align with the sex they were assigned at birth, they're often considered a gender minority. So we'll be using some terms like this today, but I just wanted to emphasize sort of the, the broad continuum that represents people's sexual orientation and gender identity. So I'm gonna move into talking about LGBT older adults and thinking about what do we know in terms of risk of dementia? And so I wanted to highlight two really great resources that have come out from the Alzheimer's Association and SAGE. And they really highlight some of the key concerns. So we know that there's an estimated nearly 3 million people currently who identify as LGBTQ plus and who are over the age of 50. As we're seeing the demographic shift in our population, we're getting older and older, people are living longer, but we're also seeing a lot of our populations aging. So we likely will see uh, increases in the LGBTQ plus aging community. And we also know that this is potentially they will see greater risk for dementia. Currently estimates of dementia in the LGBTQ community are at least at 350,000. Uh, but we have not been assessing sexual orientation and gender identity. So we are not so clear of what those numbers are. Estimates put it at at least 7% of LGBT elders are living with dementia, but that number may be higher. 
we do know that the community faces unique risks when we think about dementia. So we see greater health disparities in the community likely due to the historical and current challenges that they experience in society. Things like discrimination, uh, not having protection for jobs or housing, a lot of factors add to the daily stressors that LGBTQ people experience, but it also puts them at risk for health challenges due to either ways that they cope with these stressors or just because of these challenges they wear on the body and increase, increase your risk for challenges, things like depression, right? Uh, not going to the doctor because of past experiences with discrimination. So you don't participate in preventative screenings because you're afraid of being discriminated against. We also know that if LGBT people develop dementia, they face really unique challenges that make it much harder for them to care for themselves. So we hear, right, that their networks are becoming smaller. Many LGBT elders live alone, nearly a third of them do. So when we think about the use of caregiving, right, and we often rely on a partner, a spouse, a family member, well, if you live alone, this makes it much harder. We also know that there are income challenges for the community right, where many of them say they're not able to pay for things. We know that Alzheimer's is the most expensive disease in the nation, and many LGBT elders um, are very concerned about not having enough money to live on right now. And then again, when they start accessing aging services, many of them have experienced discrimination. So we see a delayed access in reaching out to care because of those concerns. So 40% of uh, LGBT elders have reported that they do not tell their healthcare providers about their identity. So this can make it very challenging. I wanna point out this brief that came out about two years ago on LGBT and dementia. You can find this uh, on SAGE's website as well as you can Google for the Alzheimer's Association Then this report will come up. So definitely check this out. So I've been telling you a little bit about the challenges that the community has faced. And I thought it was really important for me to highlight what are some of the historical and social contextual aspects that have impacted the community. And one of the big issues has to do with our community fighting for equality, right? And so here I show you one of the major movements of why we celebrate pride in June has to do with two women of color, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. These were two transgender women that on the early hours of June 28th, 1969, fought back against police brutality. And this is why we celebrate Pride in the month of June now. This really was one of the pivotal moments in our community's history to drive equity. Prior to this, they were experiencing quite a bit of discrimination. Police were raiding LGBT spaces. They were arresting transgender women and other people um, because laws currently were not established to protect the community. And it's important that we understand this history because this impacts health. So here I highlight just a short timeline of some of the major pieces that happened for the LGBTQ community. So you see here in 1969, the Stonewall riots, right? As well as we see when the rainbow flag was created in 1978, as well as knowing that the community did not have protections for marriage until 2015. So you can see a lot of these unique challenges historically for the community, which definitely drive health for our LGBTQ plus elders today. We also know that there have been a lot of challenges in terms of not having protections. So here I highlight the lack of protections for basic human rights, things like housing, employment, marriage, and healthcare, right? These are really major hardships that the community has had to face over their lifetime. We also know that there is a history in terms of delaying access to healthcare but it wasn't until recently, right, that we know that they removed some of the pathologizing uh, of sexual orientation and transgender identity. 
So in the past and even currently, these are treated as mental health disorders in the DSM. So for instance, a transgender person is often diagnosed with gender dysphoria as a mental health disorder in the DSM, and that's required before they can get gender affirming care. Uh, we also know that there are other laws that have impacted this, and I want to put a shout out for the Equality Act that's currently being considered by Congress. We need this act to prevent discrimination against LGBTQ plus elders. And so you can see some of these hardships that the community faces and understand how this would impact both physical health and social life in terms of stress, but also access to care. So given all of those challenges that the community has had to face, there is a lot of resilience. The community has relied on each other. They both stirred support for another, but a lot of these hardships have also led to health disparities. Things like discrimination and trauma. We do see higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder in the community because of this trauma. We also see health disparities that are linked to having to overcome much of the discrimination and inequality in our country. And we also know that these challenges can be even more difficult for people who have diverse identities. So I put in here intersecting with race, ethnicity. So people of color who also identify as LGBTQ can experience challenges that can be exacerbated uh, we also know that much of our community is less likely to be married or have children. So again, access to caregiving support is a huge challenge. And then we know about the barriers to accessing care. So I wanted to move into some of the data that we found. And here I wanted to highlight a recent study that we published that looks at subjective cognitive decline. So this is self-reported experiences of confusion or memory loss that have been happening more often or getting worse. So here you see at least one in seven LGBTQ plus adults report that they experience these memory challenges or that their memory is getting worse. And this is lower than non LGBTQ plus adults. So nearly only about one in 10 experience memory problems. I wanted to show you, we did a study where we looked at what are the differences for LGBTQ plus elders uh, by subgroups. And so here I highlight some members of the community that are more likely to report some of these memory problems. So we see higher rates of self-reported cognitive decline or subjective cognitive decline in lesbian cisgender women nearly 17% report that. We also see that it's higher for bisexual individuals, people who identify their sexual orientation as another identity, but identify as a cisgender male or female, nearly 17%. And then you see here also transgender individuals at 17%. So we do see that subgroups in the community are more likely to report these problems and this concerns us given this is a potential risk factor for dementia. So what is the research saying? Well, I wanted to highlight some of the recent studies. So here's a study using data uh, by Dr. Jaime Perales Puchal, who looked at risk of dementia and mild cognitive impairment in same-sex couples who were participating in the Alzheimer's Coordinating Center data. This is a national coordinating center that works with uh, people in the Alzheimer's disease research centers. Um, so what they found was no difference. Excuse me, I'm getting like an allergy attack. <coughs> um, they found no difference in risk of mild cognitive impairment and dementia, even though the rates were higher. Um, it was not significantly different. So uh, basically showing there was no difference, similar rates of dementia and mild cognitive impairment in same-sex relationships compared to opposite sex. We then have a really pivotal study by Christina Dragon that was put out in back in 2017 
that was one of the first to use Medicare data to look at diagnoses of dementia. And what Christina found was higher rates of dementia among transgender people, nearly 18% compared to 12%. So again, showing a signal that there may be greater concerns for the community. Next, a recent study using data from the National Social Life Health and Aging Project, or NSHAP. They looked at sexual minorities in 2015 and 2016 to look at if there were differences in rates of cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment, as well as early dementia. And they did find that LGB, right, lesbian, gay, bisexual adults, were two times more likely to had a two times higher odds of mild cognitive impairment or early dementia compared to heterosexual adults. So we are seeing a concern around risk. The next study looked at same sex couples in cognitive impairment using the health and retirement study. Uh, the health and retirement study just started collecting sexual orientation. I believe it was back in 2017, but they used this data to look at, is there a difference in odds of developing cognitive impairment? Looking at same sex partners versus different sex partners. And what they found from the health and retirement study was that there was a 78% higher odds of same sex partners having cognitive impairment compared to their um, heterosexual or different sex partners. So this is another signal of concern. Then we have a recent study that looked at memory and executive function. These are two um, cognitive skills and wanted to see if there were any differences in LGB people compared to heterosexual adults. And this is using data from Canada. So it was a population-based sample of community-dwelling older adults. This study actually found that L lesbian, gay, and bisexual people actually demonstrated better memory performance. This is a cross-sectional study, but compared to heterosexual adults. So we're actually seeing there may be some protective aspects going on that deserve further study but they didn't find any differences in executive function. So this is things like multitasking, right? Being able to plan or do unique tasks. So there was no difference by sexual orientation. So this drives us to really thinking about, right? Perspective matters. And so what I'm showing to you today right here is basically the movement advancement project that highlights some of the challenges in terms of policy and equity in states. And so you can see here, right, it sort of highlights if you're in green, there are a lot of policies that are in place to support LGBTQ plus people. But um, in some of the states, you see there's a lot of work to be done. And this is a concern for us when we think about this community that develops dementia. Will they be able to access you know, affirming and inclusive care in these states? Uh, will there be opportunities to collect sexual orientation and gender identity in these states so that we will know about the dementia concerns for people living there? And so I wanted to really point out that we need to be driving changes at the policy level to support our LGBTQ elders who are developing dementia. So this is a great need. Again, I wanted to also point out that a unique population that we need to be doing more with is our transgender, um, gender minority, or gender diverse communities. We know that they experience unique challenges when we compare them to their cisgender, but also their LGB counterparts, right? So we see challenges in terms of poverty, greater likelihood of being unhoused or homeless or unemployed. We also see greater challenges in terms of mental health. And these are major concerns. So I really, we need more research that understands both the needs of LGBT people, but specifically transgender elders. 
We need research on this so that we can understand their unique challenges, but also ways that we can help them to overcome these challenges, but we can also improve care for everyone. So I wanted to point this out that this is a, a community that faces disproportionate social inequities that deserve um, more research and change. We also have quite a bit of current knowledge gaps when we think about our LGBTQIA plus elders. So some of these include, right, many studies, but also service providers do not collect um, identity information. So we greatly need collection of sexual orientation and gender identity data, right? We need to be asking about this. If we do not ask, um, we will not be able to understand the unique needs of this community. There's been some reluctance to ask this saying that, oh, we don't wanna offend anyone, but most of the research shows that LGBTQIA plus people don't have an issue with filling out sexual orientation and gender identity questions. So you're definitely not going to offend them by asking. We also need to advocate that greater collection happens at the national level. So the US census, we greatly need to collect this so that we can understand Right? What is the um, population of LGBTQ elders in our country? Where can we, um, where do they need the greatest support? And what additional research is needed? So if we don't collect this, we're not going to be able to answer some of these future questions or even improve care for those living with dementia. The other area that we really need to consider are our communities of color. Right, we have LGBTQIA plus elders who are also members of communities of color, and we need to understand how this intersects with their unique health needs. How does this shape their health? Do they have unique challenges compared to their LGBTQIA plus counterparts who are white? We need to understand that. Currently, we've had problems in LGBTQIA plus research in terms of white LGBTQIA plus people being overrepresented in research. So we greatly need to focus on efforts that recruit our LGBTQIA plus communities of color. We also need longitudinal data, right? In order for us to really understand dementia risks, we need to be able to follow people over time to understand how do they develop dementia? What are their unique challenges if they're living with dementia? How do we support those that are caring for them? Currently, there are major gaps in understanding caregiving needs. So we need more research in that space as well as to develop interventions that are tailored for the community and can address their unique needs. Finally, we need research that's longitudinal that focuses on subgroups. I showed you earlier some of the groups that were reporting greater memory problems, right? Among lesbian women, among bisexual seniors, among transgender people, and those who identify their identity as something else, right? So we greatly need to be doing research with those communities so that we can understand their unique needs and we can address some of these challenges. Then we also need to be thinking about population level data and how we can disaggregate it so that we can look at differences by age. So different age groups of LGBTQIA plus elders is greatly needed. Currently, we see that the participants in our studies tend to be younger than their heterosexual cisgender counterparts. So we need to do a lot more work to understand the different age groups and how this is impacting their health. So I wanted to close a bit today with highlighting some recommendations that I have of how we can advance research and care for LGBTQ plus people living with dementia. So the current data that we have, which is greatly limited, shows that there's either a similar or higher risk for dementia and cognitive impairment in LGBTQIA plus populations, especially compared to their cisgender heterosexual counterparts. 
And so while we're seeing this, we need more studies. We need more research to understand how we can meet the needs of this community. We also need to be promoting early detection and screening in those who are having memory or thinking challenges. So we need to tailor services and make them inclusive for LGBTQIA plus people. We also need to be collecting more data on sexual orientation and gender identity. So SOGI data. That includes organizations changing their form, asking things like gender identity, sex assigned at birth, as well as people's sexual orientation. It's very important that you collect these. It is one of the ways that you can start modeling change at your institutions by making it more inclusive and asking these questions. We also need more interventions that meet the needs of our community. So today I'm highlighting two that are going on. Aging with Pride, the IDEA study is a caregiver and intervention for people that are caregivers or are living with dementia, as well as there's been some work looking at the savvy caregiver intervention for LGBTQIA plus communities. And then finally, my hope today is that you think about advocacy. I mentioned the Equality Act, we need to support our community. We need to be asking Congress to pass these laws to protect the LGBTQIA community, ensuring that services are inclusive. And when you go to seek care, you're not discriminated against. That is so important. And our LGBTQIA elders deserve that. Finally, a bit more about the work that you're doing. I encourage you to give back. Our community is resilient. Uh, the LGBTQ community is welcome to invite allies and others to join, but I encourage you, volunteer, give back. If you want to learn more about our community's needs, get involved. That means things like hiring LGBTQIA plus people to work with you, to work on your projects, to work at your location. LGBTQIA plus people want to see members of their community in these spaces. So I encourage you to consider that. Also give back, give money. Money is really what drives a lot of our programming. So if you can make donations to groups that are doing some of this good, I encourage you to do that. And then finally, as a true ally, one of the big pieces that's important is that we pay people for their time, but we also keep our word. So show up. If you're saying you're coming, please show up and make sure you do that. So that's my final really message. I just want to um, thank everyone the opportunity to present, uh, highlight my funding from the National Institutes of Health and specifically the National Institute on Aging. I don't have any conflicts to report. And I just wanted to thank you for having me today. There are many people that have been supporting me in this work, and I'm so grateful to be sharing it with you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. Outstanding. Oh, <laughs> outstanding, Dr. Flat. That was just an amazing presentation. And, and thank you for all of your, uh, your research and your leadership. Um, in this regard that we, we we've collaborated so much uh during pride month and i'm hoping that we can continue our momentum in this drum beat um moving forward so i'd like to share just a few uh slides before we um get into our q a period and i will Sorry, my slides. Let me try again if I can. Okay, J Jason, can you see my, my screen? I can't, Dr. Hill. Okay, all right. Here we go. There we go. All right, all right. 
sorry for that, that minor delay there. But um, as, as Jason, as I said earlier, just really excited about uh, what we can all do together in this pursuit of health equity. Thank you, Dr. Flat, for everything that, you, that you're doing and uh, just echoing uh, Amelia uh, Schaefer, our new Senior Director for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. Our intent at the Alzheimer's Association is to really be a bridge uh, between uh, research and uh, care and support for all communities around the world. And, and certainly LGBT communities are, pri are a priority for us. That, that symbol right there is the, the, uh, the, the marriage, if you will, between uh, a science and work in communities to provide resources so critical and important. What's fundamental to this uh, certainly is our concepts of diversity uh, equity and inclusion with diversity, uh, you know, really taking into account of who's at the table and who's not and whose perspectives are being considered. And Dr. Flat certainly highlighted a few of those for LGBT communities and it's really important. And then for inclusion, you know, being intentional, you know, once we identify a need to, to, uh, to, to, to adhere and to respond to a lack of diversity, being inclusive about including those perspectives individuals and communities in the work that we do. And certainly our goal of equity is providing resources, opportunities to people in the, in the ways that they can benefit from them. Not all in the, in the same way, but in the ways that people can benefit from them. It's important because we know the, the facts and figures from the, 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 the statistics from the facts and figures report, the Alzheimer's Association facts and figures report. This is a public health priority. More than 6 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's. COVID has has uh, certainly hit people with Alzheimer's hard and uh, costs are up. Disparities exist, uh, Dr. Flat uh, mentioned this and certainly there's a dearth of information for various groups that we've got to understand more about. LGBT communities are one of those, American Indian and Alaska Native rural populations. And when we think about these disparities, you know, it's one way to look at the number, the constellation of factors that could be at play for creating and sustaining these disparities uh, include those that are fundamental, certainly having access to quality health care uh, or you know, even being involved in research so that we can identify these factors uh, for the disparities is fundamental to understanding these disparities. And then there, there are those, there are those uh, factors that are unique for specific populations. Um, that are, are disproportionately affected, right? And so we saw this slide, Dr. Flat showed this, but discrimination, LGBT adults uh, living with uh, dementia face unique challenges. Um, some are living alone, social isolation has been uh, identified by the Lancet Commission as a modifiable risk factor. Others are you know, discrimination in the healthcare uh, system with, you know, with 40% are saying that their healthcare providers don't know their sexual orientation, right? So really important that we understand this constellation. There was a just a tremendous report, we're talking about disparities on race, ethnicity, and Alzheimer's uh, that was released by the association. And it doubled down on the impact of unfair treatment and discrimination uh, when uh, people are looking to access care. So of the respondents of the special report, all, nearly all of the racial and ethnic populations reported uh, some perceptions and experiences of discrimination uh, in the healthcare system, along with uh, LGBT uh, populations. So really, really important. And then another, you know, really important uh, aspect of fundamental part of understanding these disparities is uh, having all communities be a part of uh, clinical trials research, right? Really important to understand the whether treatments are safe or effective in all communities, and right, so we don't, we don't just, we just don't have enough information uh, about LGBT communities and racial and ethnic, racial ethnic populations in this regard, right? So, so much more to do about being intentional uh, about recruiting uh, you know, diverse underrepresented groups into into clinical trials, and so this all kind of comes to a a point where we're really looking to understand. You know, those environmental factors that could, as Jason, Dr. Flat mentioned, housing, access to quality health care, you know, and, and how that links to culture, sociocultural factors, discrimination in the healthcare system, discrimination in society, right? Because of, 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 of various identities that are so, that, 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 that are so important and how that links into behavior, 
seeking care, seeking dementia care is a behavior and it can be influenced uh, by people's perception of, of uh, being treated unfairly when doing so or their reality, their actual experience of having been discriminated. And all of that creates a pathway, right? A unique pathway for risk uh, when we think about uh, amyloid plaques and tall tangles and how it starts you know, upstream with environmental factors and a, and a late diagnosis or none at all and, and how all of that was, was really linked to uh, perceptions of unfair treatment. So from a diversity, equity and inclusion perspective, we certainly advocate and we're looking to promote uh, more multi-level health disparities research in the way that Dr. Flatt mentioned, more diversity uh, in the health uh, care system so that uh, people uh, can identify people in the, in the health care system that, that are from their community. So really thinking about diversity in, in those spaces, uh, enhancing cultural competence and, and really not just competence, but humility for us all so that so that when we're providing care or conducting community outreach or, or you know, delivering presentations, right, that we are certainly uh, uh, holding all people's community and, and their identities and their backgrounds in the highest of, of, of regard, uh, holding everyone accountable to, to this and providing training and opportunities to get better. And uh, certainly what's priority for the Alzheimer's Association is participatory engagement, right, really seeking uh, partnerships with uh, national and local organizations that have garnered this trust in, in, with communities and, and have uh, shown some success. So how can we, as the Alzheimer's Association, work with organizations to help us provide our resources, which are many times free of charge? You know, we've got a free 1-800 number or free resources around the, the 10 warning signs or support for caregivers, right? So how can we do a better job of getting our resources into communities. Uh, and, and, and in this regard, the people that need us the most, right? And so, uh, Amelia, I wanted to, 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 uh, to pitch it over to you because you, you're doing so much in this, in this regard with our work with, with SAGE. And, and uh, we're certainly looking for other partners, you know, to work with us and SAGE so that we can provide these resources to even more LGBT communities. So, Amelia, you want to talk a little bit about um, what we what we have going on with Sage and what some next steps can be? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Carl. Well, you know, uh, none of us does this work best alone. I think when when we're talking about how do we lift up a community, it really is in partnership with one another. And so, you know, the Alzheimer's Association is looking for um, individuals and people who are connected with. Um, organizations to partner so that we can get the message out into all communities about Alzheimer's and dementia and the resources that are available and specifically the resources that may be uh, more LGBTQ friendly or LGBTQ specific. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things we're really looking for. And all of you here care about uh, both of these topics, it seems. And so um, I'm going to put my email address in the chat so that you can email me if you have questions about resources or if you are looking to be connected and trying to figure out how you can make a difference in your own community. Um, you know, both SAGE and the Alzheimer's Association rely on volunteers uh, as well. So um, I'll put that in the in the chat. Uh, and we welcome welcome you to join us. With that, though, I think we do have a little bit of time for questions. We have about nine minutes left. So we did get some good questions that came in. So I'm going to uh, read the questions and have you all uh, answer these. I may call on you. <laughs> but the first question is really, and I think, um, Dr. Flat, you really spoke to this, which is, you know, what do we know about the transgender community? And their risk for dementia. And, and you talked about that a little bit, but will you reiterate kind of what we know, what we don't know, and what you see as important going forward? Yeah, sure. So I'm happy to um, answer that. Uh, really, I think it's important, uh, sort of the, the question, it's important that we don't think about um, our transgender community as um, being transgender as a disease. Right, and remember that there isn't anything different about their brains. That's not what we're proposing. Really, what it has to do with is that our transgender community faces a lot of obstacles. 
in daily life. That's discrimination, right? That is victimization. We know in our country, for instance, transgender women of color are being killed. Um, we have more murders uh, this year among transgender women of color than we have had in previous years. So the community is under attack. Think about how that stress would impact your health on a daily life. Having to overcome that, worrying about your safety, right? That is very difficult. And if you've actually experienced trauma in some way, we do show that that impacts the brain, right? So I have a study that was one of the first to look at post-traumatic stress disorder in uh, community dwelling older adults. And what we found is that if you had a diagnosis of PTSD, you were two times more likely to develop dementia as you get older. We know that there is something happening to the brain from stress and trauma and overcoming these challenges, and this can put you at higher risk for dementia. If we're going to make changes, we need to change our society. We need to change how we provide care to our diverse communities using affirming language, not misgendering people, right? But also showing that you hire transgender people in at your work sites, right? Just like we know about culturally competent or affirming care that you need to have people from that community represented. And so that is a big piece that you can do. And encourage screening help uh, re remove some of the barriers to accessing care that the community faces. That's also really important. So that's what I want to emphasize is just really meeting people where they are, they are, understanding that members of our community face unique challenges, and they've been overcoming discrimination, stress, trauma for over their lifetime. And so we need to really uh, improve care and the services that we're doing. So that's the, that's the true message for how we can better support our trans elders. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Flatt. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people have questions about will there be a recording available? Will these slides be available? We, we are recording this. We will send this out. Um, to folks as well. So yes, that, that will all be made available. Um, one, one person is asking, could the panelists please address their use of diverse to describe individuals and perspectives when my understanding is the term is only appropriate for groups? Uh, for example, a group is diverse, not a person. Who wants to tackle that? Yeah, I'll jump in there. I think it's a really good point. And, um, you know, I use the word diverse um, in a very broad sense to think of diverse perspectives, right? So, so the number of, and thinking of those constellation of factors um, that could put uh, communities at risk, right? That there are different, uh, you know, divergent pathways that not, not all the same, right? And so, so thinking of the, uh, the diversity of, of risk factors, of environmental or sociocultural factors that could put individuals at risk, I think is important. So acknowledging which pathways or perspectives aren't being considered and then being intentional about understanding, you know, those pathways for um, uh, communities and populations that are disproportionately affected or just understudied. We don't know enough about, right? And so, I think of it from that perspective. I don't know, Jason, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I agree. It's a good point, right? And I think it's important that we don't just think of an individual, but realize that groups are diverse and use that. Um, I use the term diverse often to represent sort of these intersecting identities that we know community members have, but also our communities are a part of. So I think it's a great point and um, important to remember it applies to groups and not individuals. 
Great. And we have uh, another question here, Carl, you might want to tackle and I can say a couple things as well. How does the Alzheimer's Association ensure that goals and priorities are in line with the values of LGBTQ plus older adults? Is this community being represented on boards and community committees and are persons living with dementia within these communities being included in meetings to provide their insights? Carl, you want to tackle that? Yeah, I'll start, Amelia, but I know you have some some good insight here. Um, but for us, it starts with partnerships. I mean, we're looking, you know, for opportunities to highlight, you know, leaders and uh, leading researchers uh, like we have today with Dr. Flat. But, you know, also using this forum as a way to create a momentum for us to partner with organizations. So making our intention you know, known that we're looking for you know, partnerships with organizations that can help us. And we don't know everything, right? And we don't know how best to recruit, you know, more uh, inclusive uh, boards at the chapter level. So, you know, we need uh, participatory engagement and collaboration so that we can move forward, you know? And so, Amelia, in, any ideas of specific ideas there, how we might yes. move forward? Yeah, I, I would say, and I know we just have a couple minutes left, I, I think any organization who's wanting to work with communities, um, there's a great saying, nothing about us without us. And I think any organization who is looking to really live that has to take a hard look at themselves and it has to be honest and, and then has to listen to communities. And, and I think we've done that as an association. And I think having Sage as a partner has certainly helped us, but I think it's understanding uh, that visibility, it can be an issue. So we don't even know sometimes, right? We don't know all of the individuals who might be living with dementia within these communities. So that visibility is an important piece. I know, um, and Sage does a lot of work in that as well, but it's, but it's listening and I think it's learning. And I think those are two really important things. I have one last question um, uh, that, that I hope we can fit into this minute. Um, is there any increased risk with those on estrogen or testosterone supplements um, with persons in the transgender community who've undergone HRT? Has there been any research on whether the change in hormones may play an increased risk? Dr. Flat? So I think it's too soon to know. Um, there is one study that was just published. I was actually a reviewer on it in the, I think it's in the Journal of Human Sexuality, but it showed, it looked at transgender women and men and looked at, are there differences in their cognition uh, over time if they're receiving affirming hormones, right? And there has been no research showing that they have a higher risk for dementia um, they actually found uh, better cognition among the transgender elders. They're not linking it necessarily to the affirming hormones, but more about what's affirming is they're being able to be who they are, right? And that's more important and probably beneficial for health. So we're not finding any data about the effects right now of hormones on brain health. It would be something important to study but the one study from Amsterdam that I've seen um, did not show that it had a negative impact at all, but it's not, we don't know if it's linked to the hormones or not. Great, thank you. With that, Carl, I'll let uh, turn it over to you to close us out and thank you all for coming. Oh, Amelia, and I would just say quickly, thank you for moderating a, a great session. Certainly Dr. Jason Flad and uh, Reynaldo Morales from SAGE and also Stephanie Ross Young with the Alzheimer's Association for just a great team. And most importantly, all of our participants for taking the time to, to, to join us today. We're hoping this is the start of a uh, great momentum, keeping the, the, the drum beat going uh, all throughout the year and, and celebrating you know, what we have accomplished and what we discover uh, during Pride Month, but keeping this going. So thanks so much to, to the community and we're looking forward to all of our, all of our next steps. To be continued. Thank you.